Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, this is meant to be one of those sessions where there's learning in terms of tangible takeaways uh, for all of you. Uh, we will first go around and, and, you know, actually hear from the experience of these leaders who have spearheaded a lot of transformation for their respective organizations. Uh, during the course of the session, please feel free to also maybe ask questions, interject us. Uh, we'd be more than happy to take up audience questions when I queue you. Uh, but thank you so much for being here and, and maybe over to the panelists. I'm going to start off with, you know, first actually understanding a very contextual question in terms of what are some of the transformation initiatives that you all have either personally overseen or spearheaded within your respective organizations. Prashop, I'd like to start with you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, hi. Now, we are at the intersection of transitioning from new normal to next normal. Now, the post-viral era is broadly classified as the next normal. So navigating into the next normal is basically what all the enterprise across the world is seeking. They need participation, they need support, and the GCC is expected to play the same role. In that backdrop, so let me just talk about a digital transformation project with the healthcare. I have Vaidhi right next to me. <laughs> now the pandemic has created a reset to look at the healthcare vision, especially payer care management. The reason being that with the reduced barriers of entry, the born on the cloud healthcare outfit, we are able to pose a significant challenge to the incumbents as well as the legacy organization. Now these organizations do have certain things in their favor. So let's call that is their tribal advantage. Number one, they are born on the cloud. So that means they have no legacy. We being born on the cloud, all the applications are on the microservices. So that means they primarily have an ability and agility to respond to the market as well as a create a product on the fly. The third one, they could also get certain vital stat from the wearable devices and they can create a healthcare offer which is extremely personalized and bespoke. On other hand, we have the legacy organization. They may not have all this luxury and flexibility to a large extent. The reason being that they have multiple uh, you know, decades of experience and their, their tech stack is not necessarily very modern. Second is that some of the applications are so legacy, finding those people is like far and few, and they are often very expensive. The third one is that some of these people would have been actually undergone a journey in such a way that they would have been outsourced, insource, outsourced. So somewhere down the line, the strength of the code, the dead code, the issues are many. So the ask was very precise and clear to us future-proof the roadmap, the transformation, and modernize the tech stack. The challenges were very Herculean for a simple reason. You have 100 million lines of code, and you have no idea about the strength of the code. And the last thing what you want to do is basically do a heavy lifting. Second is that you need to basically create an app mode factory with a short runway. So at this point in time, we need to be something different than the usual project approach. And at this section, we introduce IBM Garage methodology. Just a definition of garage is nothing but, it is a collection of practices, woven as a methodology, bringing all the people, processes, framework, and uh, uh, everything together mm -hmm. to accelerate the transformation. So typically, this consists of like, around the six steps, discover, envision, re uh, reason, develop, operate, scale, and learn. I'll just talk about only two things. One is a discover. In the discover stage, what normally happens that you sit with the client, you ground the business idea, and you start asking those very fundamental but basic questions. What is the value are you looking at? What is the end customer experience what you're looking for? What is the customer is requesting from your side? Also, what is the cost of no action? Then you get on to the next one, which is what is the total cost of ownership? What is the success criteria? What is the business objective? So on and so forth. Once you have a confirmation of all these things, you now travel to the next stage, which is called as Envision. In the Envision, you now start taking the solution to the problem statement. But in this particular case, you have 100 million lines of code, and you don't have complete clarity in terms of the strength of the code. So you need to start with what we call it as MVP, which is a minimum viable product. You don't want to do a heavy lifting to begin with. It is cupcake, right? It is easy to bake, it is easy to consume. In this particular stage, you're trying to just get certain feedback yeah. in terms of like how exactly your thought process, your rationale, all these things, and you start getting the real-time feedback from the customer, and you start tweaking, and you start modifying it. 
and the next stage is all about the scale. But in this particular stage, suppose in case if you are not getting the required the, the feedback, you could tweak in and you could still make the modification. But in a transformation project, normally what happened, you take the journey all the way till the end and then you recognize that somewhere you were off the track. And often that's one of the reasons why the transformation project do fail. So in this particular stage, right at the beginning, you have an ability to check your hypothesis and to try to get the required feedback. You also have an ability, if, you, if all the hypotheses are wrong, you could actually cut losses. You don't need to drag all the way up, right? So the long story short, like the benefit that was delivered was that A, there was a greater flexibility that was provided, and B, they were able to provide a better response to the market. So that was primarily achieved through this particular process, and all the large transformation project, once it go through this particular process, you have an ability to get the feedback then and there itself, and you could make the right modification as and when that is required. Got it. Thank you so much, Prashob. Um, I'm going to come back to the specific role that the India team played, and I know this is a question that will go around, but Joe, I'd like to pull you in at this point. Uh, you know, you you lead engineering for a pretty major organization in India. What have you personally overseen? And just not just from a local, but also from a global impact. Uh, from the transformational point of view, uh, Commvault is a smaller company than IBM. Uh, we are around 400 engineers in India and uh, under, under 400 in the US. Uh, the uh, transformation headwinds which we had to face was mostly from the transformation of the data, set, data domain. We were originally uh, an organization which was a uh, very well acclaimed solution provider for data management on-prem. And over the last few years, you know, it has gone all the way to the cloud. And to make sure that uh, our products are aligned with that uh, necessity. So uh, we, 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 had, we had been having, uh, you know, like, like Rishabh was saying, you know, a code base which has been around for 20, 20 years. Uh, but luckily, it has been architect architected so well. So we've been kind of blessed that way. But we were able to take that strength of the code, which was very well uh, serving the community. And we were able to spin it into a SaaS model. So uh, we didn't have to build a SaaS from the scratch. Behind the scenes, you know, uh, the, the metallic product, what we have behind the scenes is riding on the strengths, proven strengths. So that transformation from the engineering side internally needed an embracing of the culture that think cloud first. Yeah. Um, and you know, trying to pick and choose the features which primarily goes to the cloud first and, you know, and trying, to, trying to prioritize. Yeah. Uh, from the other side, uh, embracing the changes what we were, we were forced upon, you know, like the COVID, uh, situation which happened, uh, we were able to um, extract benefits out of that grim situation by, you know, you know changing our hiring strategies. You know, like, like if you look at many, many of us, if you were to hire, some CDs would would fly down and, and have the interviews. But this time, with the capability we have to do yeah. a remote interview session, I was able to pull in nearly 200 out of the 300 engineers to to take part in the process and it served a big deal of productivity you know, and, and within days we could find you know, lots and lots. So there are a lot of small, small steps but embracing the change was I think the key success in the transformation we could. Sure. Thanks Joe. Um, I will come back to how you prepped your teams um, against the background of COVID and your whole uh, on-prem to cloud uh, sort of SaaS transition. We'll, we'll come back to that. But Arvi, you come from a completely different <laughs> background, right? From a uh, product services, engineering services background. Um, and your transformation is probably more on the customer enablement side, right? If I'm not mistaken. So do you want to talk us through what you've overseen and yeah, sure. enable? So, yeah. So I think you've heard the consulting perspective and the, uh, the GCC's perspective. So uh, from an ESP perspective, right, engineering service provider perspective, so we have, we have a very large team of uh, engineering organization, uh, close to 15,000 people who deliver engineering services across multiple verticals, right, high tech, ISV, telecom, manufacturing, aerospace and defense and so on. So I think the last five years, uh, you would have probably heard the keynotes today morning, right, uh, the two key drivers, right, for our transformation, both from an internal perspective and also from a customer perspective, right. So the first driver is all about uh, the rotation of our business mix 
from the traditional engineering services to more of uh, digital engineering services, right? So uh, I think the, the R&D report that uh, Zeno pub publishes talks about the increasing R&D spend in the digital space, right? So I think that's that's the first driver for our uh, transformation, right? Uh, you know, if you look at our telecom sector, uh, we used to do a lot of traditional uh, network equipment provider, you know, the telecom R&D work, right? And today, if you look at the, the business mix of that group, uh, we deliver a lot of 5G, 80% of the work is one way or the other related to 5G engineering and digital engineering. If you look up the automotive space, uh, we used to do a lot of auto mechanical and auto electronics, um, you know, auto electrical kind of services and uh, solutions. Today, if you look at it, you know, the focus is shifting and we see a lot of traction on electrification, the EV space, right, the connected car. Right? and uh, the autonomous kind of areas, which are all largely software driven. Today, if you look at an automobile, 53% or more of the, the cost is actually coming in from software and electronics, right? rather than from mechanical. So that's a big shift for us. And we've got manufacturing. Uh, again, we used to do a lot of product engineering services and manufacturing from the Satyam days, which is a 25 years old team. And today we hear, uh, you know, the customer expectations are around driving industry 4.0, the uh, integration, the shop floor to uh, top floor kind of integration, the ITOT integration, AR, VR, right? Uh, a lot of uh, automation, right, of the manufacturing processes and the supply chain and so on, right? Uh, likewise, for aerospace defense, medical devices, extremely, you know, software driven. So I think, I think given this trend, uh, the major transformation that we were doing as part of integrated engineering solutions organization was in terms of building the digital engineering capability, right? And I've spent 20 years of my career in application services, and one of the big differences that I found between engineering and uh, the applications is that uh, in the apps world, you move from legacy to digital, right? And it's a zero or one kind of a thing. Here, it's a, it's, it's a combination of physical and digital, right? So there is a product which still exists. And as the customers start focusing on more connected products, more intelligent products, right? So the idea is to kind of create the digital experience, right? Um, and, and then, and then, so internally the challenge has been to kind of how do we build that capability, but within, yeah. right? This is not the same as the digital uh, capabilities of in the applications domain or in the infra domain. So we created a CTO office. We started ramping up those capabilities over the last uh, three to four years. We also acquired a couple of capabilities around customer experience, styling, and so on and so forth. And the biggest transformation that we undertook was in terms of integrating, uh, you know, these capabilities to kind of create the right solution. So we have a very good mix of digital and traditional engineering, right, within the IES group. So that's the first main thing, right? The second big transformation that we observed, right, over the last five years, the second big driver yeah. were the customers themselves, right? The customer expectations changed a lot, right? When we first started, it was more of ERD outsourcing was a little bit more on the uh, non-core, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, I wouldn't say staffing, but you know, a lot of managed services, but an, as an extended organization. But today, the you know, I think uh, the capacity requirements are bursting at the seams. So the, the, the question that customers are asking us are, you know, uh, can you do design to build, yeah. right? Can you do R to part? Right? Do you have the end-to-end -end capabilities from chip to cloud, right? And so, I mean, last five years, the big transformation that we have done is to kind of fill up all those white spaces, right? We acquired Cerium, which brought in the ASIC and the FPGA capabilities, right? We created an embedded solutions team. Then we acquired Pininfarina, which is an Italian design firm, which actually helps us with styling of uh, any product, right? And uh, so the idea now is, uh, the second question that customers are also asking is, you know, you are part of a $21 billion Mahindra group and you have manufacturing facilities, right? You have an automobile, you know, automotive division within Mahindra. How do you bring to bear those capabilities and help us innovate, help us build end-to-end -end solutions? So today we work very closely with the uh, m, &M uh, Automotive uh, Group. We have an aerostructures uh, manufacturing plant in Bangalore. So uh, my own uh, a and uh, engineering practice works very closely, right, with the parent company groups and uh, what we try to conceive are end-to-end -end solutions. So a huge amount of solution integration happening right from design of customer experience, product design, styling, detailed design engineering, prototyping, building, and then of course the product sustenance. So these are the two key transformations that we've been going through and I'm happy to share that we are at a pretty good place now in terms of being able to offer that not only end-to-end -end capabilities but also a lot of uh, innovation and solution integration capabilities to our customers across all the verticals I just talked about. Thank you so much, Arvi. We'll come back to a couple of those in terms of sure. threading the team. Um, Vedinathan, I'm going to come to you. You've, yeah. you know, you walked us through this amazing deck, so I think we have view of the kind of transformation that the organization undertook. Um, 
So maybe summarize it for us, uh, but also specifically point to the India team's role, right? That was played in in enabling all of what you talked to us about. Uh, highlight that so that you know the audience can maybe learn and understand. No, absolutely, absolutely. So I think I think uh, other than what I talked um, in my previous uh, slides was uh, the main thing that uh, healthcare wanted was the cultural mindset change for people. Um, especially people who are using the systems, who are using the things, uh, because they are used, they are very uh, uh, equally, um, usually adapted to the lower, the, the legacy technological pieces of it, and and you work with around 90 to 95 percent of the people who don't, who come from a non-tech background. They are primary physicians, they are nurses, the people who are in the administrative staffs, things around that. So having them to you know talk about why this the transformation is required, why the experience has to be changed, things around that, it's not an easy job. Mm. So first you need to have that kind of a cultural mindset change to work along with them, drive along with them to talk about the need of the transformations on that. Um, that's one thing. Uh, the major contribution that um, so Providence India was 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 formed for uh, implementing the accelerating the uh, the digital transformation journey of healthcare so that we can able to digitally enable healthcare for a better world for across Providence. So basically, our job was to bring in the technological element and then to complement the kind of gaps that we saw in the US perspective, so that we can able to complement the gaps from a technological standpoint, and, uh, and as well as bring in the healthcare experiences that they have, so that we can able to uh, focus on the right areas where we can able to look upon in terms of you know trying to drive the transformation and see the value proposition and impact around that. A blessing in disguise happened because of the COVID pandemic, so everybody started to understand the, the importance of healthcare. Yeah. But even prior to that, uh, we strategically uh, had an enterprise uh, partnership with Microsoft to start using the latest technologicals uh, in terms of you know moving from the legacy uh, systems like uh, the, the the links and the, the kind of uh, Office 2012s and SQL 2000s to the Office 365s and latest greatest technologies actually. And as part of this, as part of that, what we saw in the immediate reaction was the first when the, when the first wave hit in US, uh, the telehealth presence started in, increasing everywhere actually, yeah. and uh, we started seeing an increase in the volume from 500 people of telehealth on a week to getting into close to 7,000 people of telehealth mm -hmm. happening on the same week actually. Mm -hmm. And, and we were able to support the scale because we were able to transform the technology, bring in the right technological elements to it, on, onto it, and that's why we were able to do that actually. The second important thing that we did from India was the security and governance process. And you, as you all know that when online, uh, when, when a lot of things happen online, the malware attacks and things around that really hits either the banking industry or the healthcare industry, mm -hmm. right? So it's very important to protect your systems and applications to ensure that you have the right security guidelines, security governance process, so that any malware attack happens, your systems are well protected actually. So one of the key things that we draw from here is to drive the entire global security architecture and principles across to the entire Providence healthcare so that as and when, when, we, when we are transitioning and doing a transformation of the healthcare, yeah. we ensure that this security architecture has been reviewed in the beginning so that you don't come in the end and try to do some kind of bandages and patches to that actually. So that's a very important essential step that we draw from here, we were able to drive this from here. And that's we continue to do do, uh, do so as well. Yeah, especially the implications of something like that in the healthcare domain. Absolutely. So yes. yeah. So absolutely. Uh, I think Joe, I'm going to you know sort of pull you in here in terms of talking to us about the India GCC's role, right? In in this entire org wide transformation. Are we? I'm not going to target this question at you because India is the parent for you. <laughs> uh, but yeah. But Joe first, and then maybe Prashob on what specifically did India do for this transformation? All through the morning, uh, listening yeah. to the keynotes, right? Uh, it, it was very clear. It's not just my experience. It's the entire yeah. You know, yeah. community experience that uh, the India Development Centers, okay. the old moniker, the GCC, the new mm -hmm. moniker, uh, has moved away from the cost of the crash. Okay. The, it's moved away from, you know, oh, we can find talent there. It's really moved to, well, we can. Yeah. to end to end. We can innovate and that has that has simply imprinted on not just us who we know that yeah. to, with the headquarters. So uh, transformational push mm. is not that hard anymore unlike yeah. maybe 15 okay. years back. Uh, but where we leaders need to focus on in my opinion is you know continue to reverberate the Indian challenges uh, mm -hmm. in, 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 in building a team uh, and take take it to the mind share of the HQ leadership and make them understand that okay. right and uh, we are no more waiting for processes guidances from from the HQ anymore we can 
we have the capability to drive those decisions and all it needs is a frictionless app implementation of it. Mm -hmm. For that, it's us leadership who has to really take them along, take yeah. the HQ leadership and make them understand this is a, a relevant change what we need. It, it, uh, and when you do that, make sure it is transparent, yeah. make sure it is data driven. It's yeah. not my opinion, it, mm -hmm. it, here is the data. So uh, really, as Vaidhan said, really getting down to tightening the nuts and bolts Correct. and making sure everybody understands this is not an opinionated conversation, but this is the ma market, this is yeah. the field, yeah. this, is, this, uh, this is the truth, this is the solution. That's probably as simple as that, sure. the way I look at it. Sure. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I will just flip the question. Sure. Right? So let's first understand why digital transformation or big transformation project fails. Right, we hear so much about, you know, this is the need of the hour, but equally important to understand why a lot of the transformation, especially the big transformation project yeah. fails. Statistically speaking, 75% of the big transformation and innovation project hmm. fail to uh, meet the expectations, the impact, and stay in the budget. Now, either side of the Atlantic has the same story. So it doesn't really change. Now, what is very important for us to understand is that the transformation project take up a lot of leadership as well as organization time. It needs a lot of attention. It takes enormous amount of energy to drive the required change that is warranted. Now, here lies the seed of disappointment. Our collective study and working with our experience with other organizations as well as the GEOs, we primarily pinned down to a couple of areas that could be potentially the failure point. One is basically people, read that as a talent. The second is a mindset, read that as a culture, yeah. and the ongoing commitment to deliver large transformation project. So now let's just look at the two keywords, right? One is the people, which is the talent. Other one is a culture, which is a mindset. And where does these two constituents lies? This lies with the GCC. So obviously yeah. there is a significant role that has been played. The second is that there is this notion that every company is a tech company, and that's a mantra post-digital world. The question is that if I'm not a tech company, how soon I could morph myself or transform myself into a tech company? The answer lies, how strong is your GCC? Because GCC can yeah. help you for that particular transformation. But now going back to the four or five areas where GCC play a significant role, especially the India part on the overall transformation, why they briefly mentioned about like the architectural challenge, because that is the, the challenge that has been addressed right here, right now. The second is the people and the processes. The third one is basically the ecosystem and the environmental part of it, right? The security challenge. Because overnight you're just opening up all your digital across all the places. So the digital, the security, all these things are matters. And all those things are addressed, managed, and transformed by the GCC in India. So India play a very significant role in that particular pursuit of happiness. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Prashok. Um, that it's also a good segue into my next question, right? How do you ready teams from all your organizations from a people, process, technology perspective in order to undertake these transformations, right? And I'll start with you, Arvi, because you spoke about a digital sort of transition. You talked about build versus buy. Do you want to maybe go a little bit into how you prepped, you know, your teams, your process, your technology in order to enable the transition or the transformation for the org? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, there was quite a bit of uh, change management that was involved, right? As we rotated to, uh, you know, from the pure uh, traditional services to the digital services, right? I think a couple of challenges. One is in terms of uh, how do we build the capability and the competency within the within the group, and uh, to some extent, I think of course there's cross skilling, upskilling, um, you know, a lot of communication with the teams and so on. But I think eventually we also realized that uh, you know the two different competencies, right? Uh, again, the challenge in terms of uh, change management as part of the transformation was uh, not to kind of say one thing is more important than the other, right? So you have a, uh, you know, 70, 80% of the team who invested 25 years of their career into mechanical engineering design and, uh, you know, uh, building of products. Yeah. And then you start talking about uh, digital as the in thing and so on. So, you know, we, we had some mixed responses on some of that. And I think we now sort of uh, reached a point where we have strike the balance 
right? Uh, that is number one, right? In terms of, uh, you know, building both capabilities in parallel, right? Sure. The second is in terms of how do we integrate these capabilities? Mm. Like I said, again, digital is all pervasive, uh, you know, uh, it's the in thing, but how do we create uh, a, a very strong collaboration between uh, the digital engineering team and the, uh, the core engineering teams and make sure that we don't lose out that opportunity to innovate? Right, that's very, very important. So we drive a lot of uh, cross-functional, uh, cross-team uh, collaboration activities, right? And the, one of the most important things that we did was to kind of build the capability within the engineering organization mm -hmm. and not depend on someone who is outside of the, the team, right? So uh, more than that, I think, uh, you know, it's also a lot of uh, communication, uh, you know, informing people about uh, what's next, talking a lot about our growth bets, yeah. right? If you take automotive as an example, you know, we're betting on electrification, the EV domain, we are, we are betting on uh, autonomous and connected. So we have open conversations with the team saying that uh, this is the, the next big wave and, uh, uh, you know, uh, those of the, I mean, uh, whoever wants to really kind of uh, make that cut over and move into some of those domains, uh, you know, we put them through extensive training and so on. IIT Madras, for example, has a wonderful EV program, right, training program. Uh, 200, 300 engineers got into it. A lot of them completed that. And now they're ready to take on the, the EV world, right, from the traditional auto world. So same with Industry X Auto. Uh, IISC has launched a wonderful program on uh, Industry X Auto. And I have my team, some of them who are from the traditional manufacturing space now attending that program, yeah. right? And uh, they would be ready in a few months' time to take on the Industry X Auto kind of solution delivery, right? So, uh, I mean, it's very inclusive. I think uh, from a change management perspective, it's a very inclusive, uh, you know, uh, thing that we do. Uh, we make sure that everyone is aware of uh, what the growth bets are, uh, in which direction the business is actually rotating, how the business mix is changing, and what's in it for them, right? Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, the, the question that we need to answer for every one of our associ associates is what's in it for them. Yeah. So whether it's a town hall meeting, now most of them are virtual anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so connect and communicate and over-communicate, right? Uh, we, we err on the over-communication side yeah. so that we, we keep it all together, right? Sure. So that's what, from a process perspective, I think as digital found its way into, not just into digitization of the products and digitalization of the projects, products. So the life cycle, uh, there was an impact on the product development life cycle, right? Uh, a lot of automation that came in, uh, you know, and, and, and there's a lot of uh, tools and technologies which team was never using before, right? And uh, the, the whole life cycle has actually uh, shortened. The product development life cycles have shortened. So obviously we have a, a platform called the New Age Delivery Platform, which was very widely adopted in the IT side. So we adopted parts of that and made sure that uh, the teams are uh, adopting to, uh, you know, the new ways of working and new ways of uh, service delivery, engineering service delivery. Okay. I'll pause there. I mean, there's yeah, a... Sure. Can go on, but yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> no, so we'll come back to it, uh, maybe in parts in the next set of questions. But Vedi, I'm going to pull you in here because uh, you talked about doing it at scale. You talked about getting down to the nuts and bolts, uh, you know, in your presentation. Um, what are the specific action items that you took, right, from from readying your organization or your teams for the change? No, uh, the, f the first thing is like, we being a, one of the startup organizations we started two and a half years back, yeah. one of the important thing is to understand is to build the right culture in place. And uh, when I say building the right culture, meaning is like getting that, getting the, uh, hiring the talents for the future is very important to understand why why do we hire people and, and, and what kind of technology we want to bring in actually. Second important thing is to also create a learning and development platform for people to understand what does the healthcare is really looks like from a workflow standpoint. Yeah. Because you can't just bring tech technology, you can't just bring changes without understanding how does the US healthcare works across. So it's very important to understand the business domain centric perspective. And with the, with the challenges that we had in last two years, not able to travel and a lot of other constraints we had, it's very important that you need to find a way to create that kind of a platform for people so that they understand the business uh, in a very fast manner and also has, a, has an ability for them to bring in the kind of ideas and, and innovation they want to bring in actually as part of it. That was one thing we did um, in terms of that. The second thing we went, the second thing we we did in terms of um, working, uh, having an effective collaborations with our US uh, teams because US team is 98% of the people have not worked with the global centers across. So there was the first time that they were starting to work with the global center teams. So ma making sure that the kind of collaborations that you have in terms of making them understand about how India exists and what kind of a culture that we want to bring is like a one team, one org kind of a culture so that you don't look this as, a, as an extended, as an entity, as a different entity, but rather looking as an extended team together was a, was a big change 
need for them in terms of understanding about the kind of collaboration and how we can able to support the entire 24 by 7 kind of a business models having people in the different time zones and able to support that actually right so that's that was that was a very important shift for people uh, especially uh, people who are in the provider space working in the healthcare organization the, the entire mindset shift got changed for them to understand that moving from the traditional way of thinking that any changes to the hospitals, any changes to the IT systems has to be proximity to the provider hospitals and clinics across. And that, that this different transformation that we brought in changed the entire mindset of the people thinking about saying that we can still able to do uh, technological solutions. We can still able to bring some digital experiences by not having to be closer to the provider space section. Got it. So the cultural bit is probably the toughest one to Absolutely. solve for. Right, the mindset yes. shift. Okay. Um, before I come to you, Joe Manas, I'm assuming someone's going to cue me for time because I don't, I don't know how much time we have left. Okay, fine. Okay, so we will wrap it up. But Joe, um, yeah, quickly in terms of how you ready the team, uh, maybe succinct, and then we will yeah. we will move on to the next set. Um, my mindset is <laughs> when I talk to my team. You know, we are product development company, hiring laptop, cream. Yeah just realize they are smarter than you, right? Yeah. So, so uh, with that, when you approach, and then when you have clarity of what you are trying to achieve from the conversation, it's very easy. You know, there is not much prepping to do. Uh, the conversations are more about priority setting, uh, conversations about why this project need to pause and you have to switch over to, you know, the, 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 the company priorities. Uh, so, f as I said, you know, I would, I would say, it has not been, uh, like you said about you know, mechanical engineers, yeah. <laughs> um, it's not that drastic in my life, I would say. Uh, but it, it's, it's about uh, ensuring that people understand people are smart. Yeah. So it's... Uh, Got, it. Got it. And for the leaders to accept that. So the mindset changes yeah. also on the leadership and side. And, and make sure HQs is right Got it. on track with us. Got it. Okay, awesome. So um, we'll just maybe quickly go around and, and find you know, specific challenges. And I just want to direct this question at Joe and Vedi in terms of, because of the GCC construct, it, uh, it's a little bit different, right, in your case. Um, what kind of challenges did you encounter? Did it have to deal with global buy-in? Did it have to be deal with local talent and ecosystem readiness? Uh, and how did you sort of mitigate it? And then we'll just maybe have summary statements from all of the leaders. So I'll start again with you, you Joe, and then maybe have Vedi step in. Uh, listening to Vaidhi about you know, a <laughs> new startup, you know, Vaidhi, it will take five to ten years for uh, for the you know US office to accept. You know, yeah. I mean, maybe now things will fast track, but when we started, it was. It was hard, yeah. But yeah. did you start in the whole India COE construct and, and mm. with a very specific persona for your organization? Because I've worked with Commodore yeah. pretty yeah. directly and yeah. um, there was a very specific persona and need that you were going to fulfill. So did that not help you or did that? No, it did. Yeah. It did. Oh. The fact that we had existed for a long time, yeah. you know, it, it, it had helped. But uh, the, the getting into the same impedance match is yeah. very, very important. Um, uh, what was the question again? Yeah. So challenges. That challenges. So, so so challenges is today the the you know, I would say technology is easy if you get the right people and you know where the priorities are. Getting a technological solution is is easy. Sure. Uh, it's all about people. It's about hiring the right people. It's about retaining them. It's it's about having them in a good mental space yeah. so that they are they are for you. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a single point challenge, yeah. I, I see. Because we have smart people around, everything else is easy. Absolutely. Okay, I hear you, Vedi. Um, so for us, uh, we started with a challenge because we launched in February 2020, and the next month we went into a lockdown situation. <laughs> um, so, so coming from uh, so coming from that standpoint, uh, we have to start looking at how do we get people virtually onboarded. We have to start working with our global teams to make them understand they can't travel now, sure. right? So having that kind of a setup environment with that. We continue to grow with the pandemic, sure. and by first year we were we were close to we were able to successfully hire 250 talent people, and by now within two years right now we are 700 plus people actually as part of the Providence India Global Center of Excellence organizations. Sure. So the main thing that we that we learned through this process was to understand about that there are there are certain challenges that are very unexpected that can able to happen. So that's very important for us to to acknowledge that presence and see how do you want to take over these challenges and what do you want to think about in terms of making some kind of a quick decision making quick drastic 
decision making in terms of you know driving those those kind of challenges things around that so that was a big thing that we we, we continue to see uh, definitely now the market conditions and, and challenges in terms of technological hiring and things around that is always um, continue to be another different challenges but what's more important is like uh, to make sure that we have the right mindset of hiring people not for today but more importantly hiring for tomorrow and and, and driving them the clear clarity and transparency in terms of how we are traversing in this journey mm -hmm. so that people understand about why they exist today and how they want to take it forward sure i had one specific question for you Vedi, only because of the industry that you operate in right how does the average indian engineer in your organization get context of a hospital that is um, situated probably across the world right and and the infrastructure and and the needs there do you artificially or uh, very you know like do you create it with a lot of intent and you have to do it artificially to some extent that context or understanding of the ecosystem so that that's where the learning and development program comes as for us actually because we started to find out that anybody who's joining has a very good knowledge about the technology from where they come from but in terms of understanding about the healthcare workflow life cycle they typically they were not able to find that actually so that was very important priority that we took in terms of working with our us partners working with our so we have a program called healthcare learning league program that's a very mandatory for everybody to learn about how does the US healthcare works in the provider space, in the payer space, in terms of how does it work in the hospitals, how does the workflow works across. It's, it's, that is something that we took actually as part of that uh, program. And now we have also created a very 360 degree view, artificial view that can able to help them for people to really understand about, you know, when they are in hospitals, what are the different uh, acronyms and the words that they keep hearing from the people so that they get to know about that information. So that when they are designing, when they are developing the systems, it really helps them to really understand saying that they are part of that actually and there's a lot of appetite of a uh, lot of Indian Indian engineers to, to work in healthcare uh, because of the last two years what has happened so everybody wants to do something back to the society yeah. back to the people things around that which is a great thing yeah. and uh, I think we have very good opportunities from a healthcare transformational standpoint got it okay um, I'm being told we're coming to the close of the session uh, do I have time for one audience question and then maybe closing statements yeah one audience question no questions. Either they did a damn good job or... <laughs> if no, I have a wish list. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And this is for Vaidhi. Sure. Uh, see, Vaidhi, we, uh, especially in the health healthcare, right? Uh, you're talking about EHRs. Uh, we are in such a bad shape, like yeah. India, right? I don't know where my x-rays are, my doctor doesn't have it, <laughs> my hospital doesn't have it. I am really wishing next time we meet uh, for the conference, you would be standing here and telling how you push that thing into at least 10 percent of the Indian big hospitals because Absolutely. that's a big <laughs> deal. You know? We are really sitting on a big issue. I don't know what medicines I, I, I had been prescribed. I mean, you know, it's I don't know how we survive. So maybe you. you no, no, absolutely, absolutely, so. absolutely. We, we we wish to have that as part of our aspirations, and we will definitely get into the Indian market as well. Awesome. So uh, we're going to start from that side of the stage and maybe have 30 second closing statements. Uh, are we specifically with you, new charters, new priorities you're now going to be taking on as a, as a result of the transformation that you've undergone? And then we just go down the line um, before we close. Yeah, I think uh, probably it'll be a bit of repetition, but uh, I, think we have, I think we're all set up for huge success in the next uh, five to 10 years as Indian engineering organization as well, right? Um, so, like I, said, I explained the transformation journey for the last five years, uh, now there's an end-to-end -end capability um, starting from concept to design, both traditional and digital engineering. So, I think, I think it's time to scale. Uh, obviously, the, the talent challenges for the last uh, one, two years uh, are real and, you know, they're, they're quite challenging. But uh, I think as, uh, you know, once we overcome the talent supply, supply chain issues, and hopefully we will, I think there's a lot of uh, solutions coming up, right, on that front as we build that capability, right, within the country. I think we'll be able to scale very rapidly and uh, be able to meet the, the new demand, right? Uh, whether in the 5G engineering space, the uh, the mobility solution space, right? Uh, the health tech space, right? He just talked about that. So across all verticals, retail, transportation, I think we'll be able to solve a lot of global issues. And most importantly, I think we never touched upon that, but sustainability, right? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of solutions needed, engineering solutions that are needed to kind of drive sustainability across the board. I think that will be the next big wave as well. So I think uh, we're all set up for success uh, as an industry, right? Uh, and as an engineering service provider organization as well. And, uh, uh, you know, it's all about scaling from now on, sure. right? Joe? Uh, from Commvault perspective, you know, we, the engineering center has been around for 22 years before 
the COE construct uh, uh, came up. And then I think our next thrust is to bring similar ramping up and, and, and competency uh, track up uh, for other business units, which is needed to really serve the entire spectrum of commodity business needs from the from India COE. Sure. Yeah, so I'll just put some stat, right? So of the 2,400 GCCs which is operating across the globe, 1,400 of them are in India and 1.4 million workforce. So I guess the India's dominance in the GCC space continue to rise. But that said, I think what is also certain encouraging signals is basically the diminishing distance between the HQ to the GCC and the lines are getting blurred and that's a good sign. But if I were to just put line a few uh, wish lists, number one, the GCC should have an executive seat in the executive council. Mm -hmm. This is the time the decision making has to be heard by the GCC. You cannot be an outpost outside, mm -hmm. a few thousand miles away, and still hope that like we are going to deliver the value. So given that you know there is a tech or a takeover that is taking place, GCC has to have a seat in the uh, executive council, and that's no negotiable. Second is that the value creation, so the, the cost arbitrage and the expertise in certain process that is given that is a premise in which GCC has been created, but the value creation has to happen. The second is that there has to be a light connection to the mothership, especially in terms of pulling the culture and the people selectively. I am carefully using the word selectively because you do not want to basically replicate everything as it is. What you think is most appropriate, that need to bring in. Other one is the data. Now every GCC, despite whichever like this spectrum of like the vertical you belongs to, end of the day the data is getting processed here. And this data are providing the demand signal. So it would determine like what would be the sales, what would be the marketing, what would be the demand of the product, everything. The last one is the people as well as the processes. But the summary, the digital determination of the enterprise has to be owned by GCC and none other than that. Maybe. I think I think in summary, um, the the providence is, is is marching towards accelerating the digital health care transformation journey, right? Um, so we want to move away. We want to be one of the pioneers in providence, uh, in, the, in 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 India Global Center of Excellence from a healthcare standpoint, to move away from the thinking of. The, the old healthcare traditional versions of hospitals being the central pivoting and then having to find out all the physicians and medicines and everything around uh, pertaining to the hospitals to move into consumer center and patient being the central pivoting point. So that all the different, the, so that we, we want to give that entire self serve and empowerment to all the patients and consumers to decide which kind of hospitals, what kind of doctors they want to do, everything with an experiences they have to go through. So that's something we want to do um, in terms of that. And there are new healthcare programs that has come up because of the pandemic. And we want to make sure it's like, you know, that we are able to take care of those kind of programs, uh, bringing in technology as a forefront, so that we don't have to, again, go back to the traditional way of you know, managing those kind of health care. OK, thank you. Uh, I'd love to continue, but I'm already getting dead stares from my team. So thank you so much, uh, I think, for taking the time out to be here. Uh, we will be available offline around the event for any of you who want to catch us to ask us questions. Thank you for being here. Um, yeah, over to you, Manan.